good morning. Welcome to Lincoln Hills Community Church. We appreciate the fact that you've decided to join us on this Memorial Day weekend worship service. Psalm chapter 116 verse 5 tells us, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of His faithful servants. And so in America, this weekend we remember the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen who proved their true character when they put their name on the dotted line saying, I'm willing to give my all for the service of my country. And today, as Pastor reminded us in the devotional, we live in unique times. And so there is a group of people that have given all that they can give. It's our law enforcement community. It is our firefighters. It is the doctors and nurses who have one barrier against this disease, a small, thin paper or fabric mask. And so today we would ask that God would bless those people. We had asked the Lord that, that uh, he would remember those who have served, those who have given their all, and those who are still serving today. That's what we'd like to remember, but we'd also like to remember those among us who are sharing an anniversary this week. Mike and Wilma Tope are celebrating 35 years of uh, marriage this weekend. We ask that God would bless them. We know that Mike and Janet Hamill are celebrating their 43rd anniversary this week. We ask God's blessing upon them, and then we pray for Buzz and Betty Hotling. 34 years of blessed wedding bliss. And so as we remember our soldiers, our sailors, and our airmen, let's remember the joy that comes to us through the marriage ordained by God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and call us your children. We thank you for the blessings that we've seen today and the hope that we have for tomorrow. And Heavenly Father, as we turn around and we remember those who have given their all, we would tell you thank you for placing us in a country like America where we do not forget the sacrifices of those who have come before us. We would pray for those workers, those first-line responders that are giving their all today. And Heavenly Father, with the joy unmatched, we would ask your blessing upon these couples as they celebrate their anniversary. We pray for our singers, our musicians, and our technicians today. Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God that dwells in this sanctuary would go out to the homes and offices of the men and women who receive this message. We would pray for our pastor as he gives your word in your spirit as we testify about Jesus. And we ask these things in Jesus' name that you would share your joy with those on stage. For we ask it in Jesus' most precious, most perfect name. Amen.
nice have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling on the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling cats. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lights. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Following the Korean War, President Dwight Eisenhower asked that a code be developed for our American military personnel. It was a code that would give the guidelines for how our men and women in arms were to conduct themselves at all times, but especially in time of war. And it's come down to us today as being called the Code of the American Military Personnel. And on this Memorial Day weekend, it seems very appropriate for us to remind ourselves of what our men and women in arms and in uniform commit themselves to doing in behalf of our country. Let me read it to you. You may follow along. I am an American fighting man, personnel, in the forces which guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. I will never surrender of my own free will. And if in command, I will never surrender the members of my command while they still have means to resist. If I am captured, I will continue to resist by all means available. I will make every effort to escape and aid others to escape. I will accept neither parole nor special favors from the enemy. If I become a prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information or take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. If I am senior, I will take command. If not, I will obey the lawful orders of those appointed over me and will back them up in every way. Should I become a prisoner of war, I am required to give name, rank, service number, and date of birth. I will evade answering further questions to the utmost of my ability. I will make no oral or written statements disloyal to my country and its allies. I will never forget that I am an American fighting for freedom, responsible for my actions, dedicated to the principles which made my country free. I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. We're going to take a moment now and to salute those in our church who are serving in the various or have served in the various armed forces. And you're sitting at home as we show your branch. You may feel free to stand up 
We honor you even though we can't see you. God bless you. remarkable that even now our choir is still able to bless us in 2020. I wanted to call attention to a couple of uh, members of our church who are going through a difficult time. J.D. Bruce is in Sutter Roseville Hospital. He's suffering from AFib and he had difficulty breathing and I asked, uh, I asked his wife, was he scared? And she said, yes, he was scared, but He's resting easy now, and so we would continue to pray for J.D. Bruce. We would bring up Belinda Warner. She was diagnosed with uh, macular degeneration. She's been going through the treatment for four years now. And so we would pray that God's blessing would be upon her, that God's wisdom would show upon her, and that uh, he would heal our sister. And finally, we pray for the family of Wally Anderson, who passed away this week. We would pray for Harriet and the family as God ministers to them in a most wonderful and caring way. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, out of all these people that I've mentioned, we pray, Lord, that perfect prayer, Jesus, Lord, have mercy. We pray that you'd put your healing hand upon J.D., that you would give the doctors wisdom and skill. We pray for peace for the family in every way. Lord, we would pray for our sister Belinda, that you would raise her up, that you would strengthen her. Lord, as she said, told me, that she knows where her journey ends, but she knows she does not walk alone. And so, Father God, we praise your name that she has that confidence in you. And then, Lord, we would pray for the Anderson family, that you would open up the windows of heaven, pour out your blessings upon them, and we ask these things in Jesus' most precious, most powerful name. Amen. And now we are going to present a presentation of the men and women who have served from our congregation in the United States service.
We thank all of you who have served our country in military service, and uh, we remember those who have all gone before us. This morning is always a special service that we try to remember Memorial Day. It's unfortunate we're not able to be together here today, but nevertheless, we wanted to remember, as we always do, those who have served our country well. Earlier in the service this morning, we read to you the code of the American military personnel. I can remember my very first summer when I, right out of high school, I had an appointment to the Coast Guard Academy, and one of the very first things that I had to commit to memory was this code. It's an important code. It enunciates what's really important to us. I'd like to read it to you again. I will never forget that I am an American fighting for freedom, responsible for my actions. And dedicated to the principles which made my country free, I will trust in my God in the United States of America. That's the, the last of those guidelines that are given to us. And that's the one I want to focus upon this morning. All six of them are important to us. They're important to those who have served in the military. Six articles of the code. But it's this last one that just strikes me as so significant as I think through what our servicemen and women have done down through the last many, many years. The first of them simply says that I will make a commitment to being an American. In remembering those who died to keep us free, I'm impressed with one thing among all else. And that is that they lived these words even before they were ever promulgated. They were not put together until 1955 as a result of the Korean War. But even before that, men and women from the Revolutionary War on have had this commitment to being an American. These men and women, they served because they were Americans. And one of the things that they understood was to remain a people who can call our nation the United States of America. There were times when they would have to follow or respond to a call to arms. One of those people, some of you have heard of, Corporal Desmond Doss of the United States Army. He was a corpsman in the United States Army. He was also a conscientious objector. He's the only conscientious objector who was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor in World War II. Let me tell you about him for a moment, because it illustrates what I'm saying here. Doss grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist. He believed to kill someone was wrong. He would not bear arms. But when Pearl Harbor occurred, he felt compelled to take part in helping his nation be free. And so he signed up for the Navy. But he indicated that he could not kill someone. What he wanted to do was be a corpsman, so that's what he became. He was a medic in the United States Army. Before it was all done, he had won two bronze stars, a Purple Heart, and finally the Congressional Medal of Honor. That was given to him on the island of Okinawa near the end of the war. He and his his, uh, company were on an escarpment, which is kind of like a plateau there on Okinawa, and they were being mowed down by machine gun fire by the enemy. He himself was wounded, but in the midst of all of that, he literally carried and drugged over 70 of his companions who had been wounded to the edge of that escarpment, and with a rope, lowered them some 70 feet below to their safety. For that, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Honor. He represents to me the kind of people in America who, no matter what their beliefs are, believe in defending their country and responding to the call because they're an American. That last guideline says, I will fight to defend our freedom. There's an acceptance that freedom demands that we be willing to defend it. I can remember when I was a kid, one of the things, one of the earliest things I can remember my dad telling me and teaching me was that, remember, son, don't pick a fight and don't go looking for a fight. But if a bully picks on you, let him know you'll fight back. 
I don't know what my mother thought of that, but I know my father taught me an important lesson. Bullies won't continue to pick on you if you defend yourself. And as a nation, we have fought every bully who threatened our freedom and liberty. In fact, we've gone about trying to fight the bullies in the world who threaten everybody else's freedom. We accept that sometimes we need to defend our freedom. Then there's the matter of our responsibility. Let me go back to this for a minute. Fight for the defense of our freedom. Our forefathers, in the Revolutionary War, they felt that they had to fight. And we all know that Declaration of Independence. Let me read a little bit from the preamble to you. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, in this case, Great Britain, they should declare the causes which impel them to separate. Then it goes on to say in those words we probably have all memorized, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among those rights are life, liberty, and this pursuit of happiness. And then that preamble concludes with these words, whenever any form of government anywhere becomes destructive of those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. To have freedom means we have to defend it. We have that legacy from the very beginning in our nation. Then thirdly, there is the matter of responsibility. I am responsible for my actions. You know, the conduct of war is never polite. It's never pretty. But the defense of a nation nevertheless involves taking responsibility for one's actions. If I'm in command, I'll take responsibility. If I'm not in command, I'll take responsibility to follow those who are responsible. You learn that from the first moment you go to boot camp and you face that drill instructor and he says there's three words to live by, actually more, aye aye sir, no sir, and no excuse sir. You learn that there is never any excuse because you bear the responsibility. Responsibility was what I witnessed following 9-11. In all of the years that I served in the ministry, which is close to 50 now, at that point in time, 30 years had gone by, and all of the churches I've been in, I don't think I can remember but one or two young men or women ever went in the military. But following 9-11, an extraordinary thing happened in America. We saw young men and women signing up for the military like they never had before because they believed in taking responsibility to defend our nation. The fact that today's military is an all-voluntary military is a testament to the men and women who believe in shouldering responsibility for freedom. And fourthly, I'm dedicated to our nation's values and beliefs. There's a dedication to what we stand for in this country. What keeps people from serving with their every last breath and causes them not to cooperate with the enemy in any fashion when captured, is that there's a dedication to the principles that have made our nation free. America's not perfect. Far cry from it. But I'll tell you what, it's better than any other place you're going to find on the face of the earth. Freedom has been purchased at a tremendous cost by men and women down through our history. It's filled with men and women who paid the ultimate price because they believed in the freedom that we have, and they believed in defending it. One of those people, one of the very first ones that you and I probably ever learned about when we studied the Revolutionary War was a young man named Nathan Hale. Nathan Hale was a 21-year-old Yale University graduate. He was a teacher in Connecticut. In the midst of the early goings of the war, General George Washington put a call out for those who might volunteer to go behind enemy lines and gather information that would be important to him. Historians tell us that nobody volunteered except Nathan Hale. And he became what we would call today a spy, gathering information. Unfortunately, he was apprehended by the British. And General Howe of the British sentenced him to execution for espionage. As he stood there, with his legs bound and his hands bound behind his back, and he stood on a ladder that would be kicked out from under him, 
he was heard to say those words we all know. I only regret that I have but one life to give for my country. That's the kind of men and women we celebrate here today. They believed in the values and the beliefs that we have. The last thing that's good to remember is that I will trust in God and the United States of America. Our trust is first in God. It's on our money and God we trust. And without God's directing hand, there would be no America to trust. The records of Americans in conflict are filled with situations in which we never should have won. Circumstances were divinely orchestrated that brought American victory that dictated a turn in the war. Let me tell you about two instances. One of those, I'm sure you know, the Battle of Midway. The Battle of Midway took place six months. The day of the battle was exactly six months after Pearl Harbor, June 7th, 1942. In that battle, the American fleet, which had been crippled, sent out three carriers. They sent out the Enterprise, the Hornet, and a third carrier, the Yorktown, which was just barely put back together after the Battle of the Coral Sea a month before. And they went out to meet the combined fleet of the Imperial Japanese Navy that had six carriers, not to mention two or three battleships and a host of other ships. In that battle, which we had no business ever winning, the, the goal of the Japanese was to invade and take Midway Island from which they would launch an attack against Pearl Harbor and clean up the rest of Pearl Harbor, and from there could launch to the West Coast. It was a crucial battle. Historians recognize it as one of the most critical battles in the history of the world. In that battle that we had no business winning, through a, a combination of incredible errors by the Japanese, also as a result of the fact that our intelligence managed to break their code and we knew they were coming. Our ships, the three of them went out there and in five minutes, this is incredible, you know the story. In five minutes, three of their first line newest carriers were destroyed. And only hours later, the fourth one was destroyed. It was an incredible battle. When I read the story of that battle, I cannot help but recognized divine turning point of the war. And it was. It was a turning point in the war. They never recovered from this. But God's hand was in it. Let me tell you about another that maybe you're less familiar with. The War of 1812. Well, we vaguely know that because there was a song back in the 60s, you know, the Battle of 1812, Battle of New Orleans. But anyway, in this war that took place about 30 years after the Revolution, we came near to losing our independence again. The British had invaded Baltimore. Their troops had marched all the way to Washington, D.C., and they were in the midst of setting fire to everything in Washington, D.C. Did you know that the White House was totally burned down? The only thing left standing was the walls. That's how severe the invasion was. And then something happened. Less than a day after the attack, a sudden very heavy thunderstorm, possibly a hurricane, put out all the fires. It also spun off a tornado that passed right through the center of the Capitol, sitting down on Constitution Avenue. And it lifted two cannons before, off the, their mounts and dropped them several yards away, killing several British troops. And following the storm, the British returned to their ships, and many of those ships were already badly damaged. And the occupation of Washington, D.C. lasted just 26 hours. Those who study weather will tell you that in the history of Washington, D.C., in the last 300 years, there has only been about two or three tornadoes ever set down there. The hand of God was there. Our American fighting men, they believe in God because they know without him we cannot win. And we believe in America because he's made us free. The story of American military personnel is one to be proud of. And today, you and I give thanks for those who gave, as Lincoln said in his Gettysburg Address, the last full measure of their devotion, that this nation under God should not perish from this earth.
1835. A French political philosopher by the name of Alexis de Tocqueville decided to come to America. He marveled at what had taken place in America, and he wanted to see firsthand the American experiment that had brought about democracy as we are beginning to experience it here. When he came, one of the things that he noticed were the churches. He wrote back, he, he couldn't get over the fact that how many churches were filled with people. It caused him to write this statement. America is great because America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of a new battle right now, a battle the likes of which we've never known, not in my lifetime, not in my parents' lifetime, not in 100 years. It's a time that threatens our country. It threatens our economy, and it threatens our health, and threatens so many different things. But it's a time which God can deliver. And I'm reminded of the words of long ago in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then, when they do that, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I'm so grateful for those men and women who have kept us free. But ladies and gentlemen, we're also living in a time which God is calling us back to come to him. Trust in our country, but trust God above all else. And he will make us free. He will keep us free. He will heal our land. Indeed, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. God bless you. I want you now to sit back and listen to something from YouTube um, honoring our nation's dead and those who have served us. It's, uh, it'll have bagpipes playing Amazing Grace. And don't ever forget that the United States of America is still here, still free, because of his amazing grace.
this Memorial Day, we want to thank all of you who served. And God bless the United States of America, and God bless you. I'm going to ask our elder, Rich Kauser, to come now, and he's going to close our service in prayer. First thing I had to do is wipe away the tears after hearing that. Thank you, Pastor. It was a encouraging and wonderful message. You'll notice before we start praying that I'm wearing a poppy in my lapel. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, uh, the sale of the poppies has fallen, but it's just another thing to help us remember what this weekend and and Monday, which is actually the holiday, really means to many, many people. And it's not just the men and women that gave the ultimate sacrifice, but it's their families that also gave that sacrifice. But the best part about it is, with God's love and help, we recover and continue. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you very much for this day. Thank you for the message that we received. May we be reminded by you that there is something more than self. It's that old saying of my friend is, is forever. And I pray that we will remember the men and women that have given their lives and their families, and not just this weekend or Monday, but throughout the year, especially when we see a young person, man or woman, in a uniform. Just take a moment and say thank you. We ask all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen.